Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Brad Reimer. Before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind taking an extra 30 seconds and heading over to iTunes to rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. So thanks for taking the time to do that. All right, let's dive in. Brad Reimer has been president of Cloverleaf Capital Group since its inception. Cloverleaf is a mobile home park loan broker focused on loans under $1 million. Prior to co-founding and becoming president of Cloverleaf, Mr. Reimer served as the CFO of one of the top five manufactured home community portfolio owners in the United States, which was RV Horizons, which a lot of you know Frank and Dave, uh, helping lead its 16 separate funds comprised of over 1,500 investors over a four-year span. Uh, Brad had responsibilities spanning all business segments. In addition, he served as the company's business intelligence officer in 2018. Uh, Brad received an MBA from Regis University and a BA in Fine Arts from Wabash College. He began his real estate career with Marcus and Millichap in 2000 as a specialist in sales and marketing. He's based out of Denver, Colorado. Brad, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, to, to presenting here and, and just talking about the industry. Very excited about it. This is fantastic. Maybe you could start out by telling our listeners a little about your story and how you ended up in manufactured housing. Sure, sure. So I've been in commercial real estate since 2000, basically 2000 when I moved out here to Denver and kind of started, wasn't, it wasn't on purpose to, to land into commercial real estate. Had the opportunity, as you, as you stated from the fine arts, I actually jumped into be a graphic designer and kind of from right out of the gates with, uh, with Marcus and Millichap, Real estate really clicked, and not only the 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 real estate side itself, but the investment side and, and the mathematics. So I started off really understanding it, and and really, I guess, understanding the flow of how transactions take place uh, in all commercial sectors, and that's um, all the major four food groups: retail, office, uh, industrial, and multifamily, which obviously manufactured housing falls into. Obviously, back in two thousand and two thousand one. Manufactured housing was still kind, of, still had that negative stigma that it's now weaning off today. Throughout the years, over the past 20 years plus, I worked in several roles in commercial real estate, but stayed focused on it. And that's it's ranging from managing consulting firms, acting as a lender on the private capital side, running my own consulting firm, Reimer and Company, which we'll talk about in a little bit about the business analytics. Um, and then, you know, working with uh, Century Communities sister company, Regency, as a finance director and working towards the development of multifamily. And then eventually getting and working, connecting with Dave and Frank to, to become the CFO. And that's when I really, really became entrenched in the, mul- in the manufactured housing side. And then f- shortly following that, I took, you know, some time to, to collect and started Cloverleaf. And now we are here today in Cloverleaf being the parent company, Cloverleaf Capital Group, as you had mentioned, uh, being one division of the, the three. Uh, but Cloverleaf Capital Group is truly an investment consultant connecting clients uh, looking to invest in mobile home communities, which a lot of them, a uh, big tranche underneath a million dollars. That's kind of my niche. That's my space. That's where I help clients and, and investors land their communities, land their investments. That's fantastic. Brad, you know, what are the most important things that passive investors need to look out for when investing into, into mobile home parks? You know, you sure. mentioned the 1,500 investors through, you know, all those funds with RV Horizons. You know, what, what are the big things that limited partner LPs uh, need to look out for in the asset class, you know, from your experience, from your standpoint of, you know, the former CFO and kind of right. seeing all the things that you saw in your experience? Right, right. And I think kind of a unique position for me to be in is having the investors that were passive. And we had true passive investors and we had investors 
in the portfolio that didn't want to be part of the numbers, didn't want to be passive. They wanted to, to, to touch and feel and, and understand the communities themselves. So, you know, I, I, I was able to, to learn and, and cater to and work with both sides. As a CFO, you're, you're also acting as an investor relations and, and working with them. I'd say, you know, with passive investors, the thing to look out for, obviously, is when you're working with, as a passive investor, you're working with somebody who's going to be guiding the portfolio. And, and you want to know and entrust in that person who's guiding the portfolio, who you're investing with and in, to, to know that they have their, their directive in place, the asset that they know, the areas that they know, and, and this, the, the amount of improvements and work that needs to be done, and also understanding the market. I think, so, I, I think that the major thing that is important is, is knowing that the person who's driving the ship, the captain who's driving the ship, knows the route, if that makes the most sense. Because they are passive investors. They're there. They're, they're, they're hoping that their money gets turned into the returns that they've been seeking and, and beyond. Definitely. You know, maybe you could shed some light. You know, I, I spend a good part of my, my month, you know, reviewing financials. Right. Uh, I'm sure as a CFO, you, you had your fair share. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what, are some, <laughs> <laughs> what are some common mistakes on mobile home park financials that, you know, people should look out for? Yeah, sure. And, I, and, and this is one element that I think separates ourselves from the, the standard. And this, that's the reason why I don't like to consider Cloverleaf's consulting group the, 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 um, a mortgage broker. Because it's so much more. That's why I call it investment consulting. Uh, my clients reach out to me to not only, they, they understand that I was a CFO. They understand that booking certain transactions, even through acquisition and the initial acquisitions, is a lot different. And there's some, there's not tricks to the trade, but there's, there's methodology that you should employ to make sure that your balance sheets and so that your, your books are following protocol that's not hurting you in the end. Because obviously most investors on the, on the smaller side are not going to hold on to these things long-term. And I say long-term over 10 years, a lot of them and the majority are looking at a five-year turnaround. And so tracking your balance sheets and accounting properly is, is probably the number one thing that I look forward to extending my menu of services uh, in, towards the end of the year and, for, and going into 22 and moving forward. I think the number one thing is knowing how to book the transaction itself and understanding how is it, how is it accounted for? Uh, how, how, is the, how is it going to be taxed? And so consulting with your CPA and making sure that that CPA understands that this transaction is not a traditional real estate transaction. It truly is a business transaction. Um, and I think that that's the number one thing. Uh, you know, I don't want to peel back and start to jump down that rabbit hole of how to <laughs> locate amortization and depreciation and, you know, all those fun things. But sure. I think overall, that's the number one thing I would look out for. And I would say, secondly, in your day-to-day and month-to-month and annual practices, your fiscal year practices, um, your, you know, knowing, having, having a diversified uh, chart of accounts for your profit and loss statements to account for home business, Versus the community business, because we are getting into the era of where mobile home communities are no longer one of those children left behind, right? And one of those soldiers left behind. It is now in the forefront, and especially in this time where low income housing is, is much needed as we recover from this pandemic. I think overall, uh, you know, have, understanding what your asset, how you need to perform your asset, and having home versus community separation. And I don't know how much in, in your former podcast you discussed that, but I would say from a CFO position of a large portfolio and, and then also talking to clients who are investing in these and, and understanding from the finance side, those two separations of business are critical, critical in today's atmosphere. And we just interviewed uh, insurance broker, Kurt Kelly. Yep. And you know, saw well. from his perspective, you know, right. why it's important to have those two business separated. So uh, yep. it's nice to hear that from the accounting standpoint, uh, it's important as well. Uh, yep. You know, tell us, Brad, what were the most valuable lessons you learned from your time as CFO at RV Horizons? Sure. I would say there's, there, I, I would say several things. I mean, obviously, staying strictly with manufactured housing, Dave and Frank are truly the gurus. And, and I was honored to, to learn and, and have kind of the crash course uh, from them. 
uh, I had worked in manufactured housing for a long time, or I had worked with it in sparingly over time in the multifamily side. Uh, obviously, one of the things developers look for that are building class A, class B um, apartment buildings are finding pieces of land that are already permitted or plotted for multiple units. And one of those is mobile home communities. And so I started to really understand the mechanics of it and, and learned the basics, but I didn't know the true science of it until I joined with Dave and Frank. And um, you know, I think overall the, the crash course and having to learn quickly, it's not like I was able to jump in as the CFO and, and have a year or two years to, to learn the amount of knowledge that those gentlemen have. So I jumped in and, and really had to learn quickly. And I used, I, and I leveraged the experience from within the company to, to learn the business itself. I would say number one overall is just what dynamics of the area, the, the macro, the macro economic elements, the geoeconomic elements are definitely important. But what other factors take come into play to assess and analyze what a community can be worth and what you're buying it at, and then what your strategy is going to be down the road. Is this going to be a three-year or a five-year or a 10-year strategy? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's great insights there. Based on your advanced experience in probability analysis, yep. what have you learned about mobile home parks that operators and investors should know? Yeah, I would say overall, understanding what the market's doing. So many times, I, I spoke last year, and I'm not acting like the sage of all time, but I, you and I had spoke early on uh, in the year about what's happening with the market. Um, and, and knowing that before you actually get into the transaction itself, being late to the game is obviously always always something that you want to avoid. But in this time when the, the cat is out of the bag, I would say, so to speak, with, with manufactured housing, the understanding what cap rates, what the market's doing, what your asset can do, what you need to do in terms of capital improvements to, to again, effectuate your strategy. Do you want to hold on to this thing for five years? And what is the market going to do in five years? Right now, we just, just the overall and current market status, we're in cap rate compression area. We have a very popular in the real estate asset class that many private equity firms, many large, large corporations are jumping into. And, and there's a lot of articles being released. And so the, the, the higher popularity and the lack of financing, or the, I guess the abundance of financing and, and the lack of other alternative options to acquire real estate makes this a very popular class. I've seen cap rates jump down 50, 60, even 100 basis points on, on average in certain areas. Understanding that, that in itself and what you want to do with the strategy is, is number one, the most important thing. And understanding what where are rates going to go, understanding what the treasuries are doing, understanding what bank rates are doing and, and what, leverage, uh, what, what leverage points they're offering uh, in terms of recapitalization or refinance. So I would say probability overall is really based on uh, the probability of how you can achieve your, your exit goals or your return goals on your asset. And that, again, goes back to what's the market doing, what's financing doing. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. And maybe we could kind of dive into that a little bit more. You know, there's a, there's a couple of different models, right? Right. Uh, and, and I'm sure that at RV Horizons, you guys kind of diversified across, you know, several of them. But the, the one big one that we kind of struggle with is this idea that there's like these low cap rate, you know, primary markets mm -hmm. that, you know, there's mobile home parks in those uh, asset classes or those, those type of assets, right? The ones in primary markets that are very, you know, five caps. Right. And you probably, since it's a, 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 a growing metro, you mm -hmm. probably could increase rents probably more consistently you know, over the long term, right? To you know, generate appreciation in the asset, right? Right. And then there's this other model of like buying higher cap rates, you know, more cash flow heavy, but they're in more secondary and tertiary markets. Yep. Uh, so with Frank and Dave's model, they kind of talk about the the Midwest kind of secondary tertiary markets a lot, but I know they also own assets in those primary markets. So maybe you could just shed some light on that on which ones performed better over your time as CFO uh, yeah. so that we can kind of look at both models and, and decide which is best for us. 
Sure. And, and, and as what, as is real estate in any sector, and as what happens through any cycle that what was is going to change. Right. And I would say that we are definitely in the evolutionary side of the business where we're changing and, and where people, even, even five years ago, 10 years ago, for sure, you could say that you're purchasing an asset at a true 10 cap on actuals today. Right. And, and anticipate maybe a seven mid seven cap, at the, at the lowest, call it 10 years ago, five years ago, right? Now, it's more of you're buying it at a seven or eight cap actual, you know, just again, going back to just community only performance. And a lot of a lot of the agents and the, the brokers today, the sales brokers that are gaining these listings are combining that home and community revenue, which, you know, is a dangerous, is a dangerous way to assess the deals. And you have to be able to separate that stuff but I think in today's market, you're buying these assets at what you would call a lower cap rate, anticipating that what you, you not only raising rents, maybe build back, bringing down and creating efficiencies in the expenses like utilities if they're leaks, but also expense inefficiencies that you can bring down and actually increase the NOI on today's numbers with a little bit of improvements and bumping the rents and build back. You're actually looking at it saying, I'm buying this at a low cap. But in today's true market, it's a it's a, it's a it's a higher cap, right? So you're buying it at today's seven percent cap on actuals, on the, the the seller's actuals. But when you employ your methodology and rent increases and build back, you're technically buying it at a ten cap. Does that make sense? But I think that those numbers have changed. Where those, that ten cap number has resonated and stuck with us for a long time, especially when I was there as a CFO and and overseeing you know just the transactions that took place. I would say. The anticipations would be different. I would shrink that by 100 to 150 basis points today, and I'd say buying it at a seven cap, and hoping to get and hoping to underwrite today at a nine cap, and maybe selling it five, three, five years down the road at a seven cap, maybe even lower. I think I think cap rate's still going to compress over the next 24 months, but I think that that's how you look at the business, right? You're not you have to look at the actuals. And the anticipated change and in, in what, what your cap rate is on your, call it your secret sauce, and then what you can exit at. Does that make sense? It does. I guess my question kind of talks about there's the primary markets that are 100% occupied. Sure. You're buying these stable assets mm-hmm. and your plan for the value add, like it's already yeah. submetered. Your plan yeah. is basically to raise rents every right. year because it's in Austin, Texas, and it's a booming right. market. And you're expecting rents to be, you know, going up more than the average, right? Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. ten plus percent. Yeah, and the, so the managers, the managers have, have, I guess to it's to a certain extent, grown familiar with the tenants. Uh, didn't raise it, didn't raise the rents, and and was you know just I guess the the tenants were were just too familiar, and they say the market's a hundred dollars more than what you're currently offering per month for just lot rents. Again, that's what's important. Um, and, and so your goals is to bump rents. I think also to add to your question, I think we were seeking as well, is what markets probably have, what, what markets or what areas have the best uh, foresight? Is that yeah, kind of what per, you're- Which performed better? You yeah, know? I would say, I would say your, your Midwest markets, your, if you look at your coasts, right? Both coasts, those, those type of assets that you're, you're buying and selling at those low cap rates, those are for investment grade, or public companies that are looking for steady, steady returns that they can return to their their shares or their shareholders, right? And those shareholders are anticipating anywhere from four to maybe five, six percent. Your true your true value add is in the Central Plains, is in the Midwest, where you have maybe some industry issues, you have some economic issues where there's been unemployment. Or say, for example, what is you know what has the pandemic caused? Um, auto industry, steel industry, uh, manufacturing plants, um, shipping, international shipping, all those type of areas that that need obviously some low income housing because you're not going to have your 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 standard middle class rents and everything like that. But you still have ability to grow rents that it doesn't get unaffordable, and and you have the markets that the tenants. It's always going to stay occupied. You have occupancy consistency. You have economic consistency in the communities themselves. And there's there's employment. So I'd say that your your Central Plains, your Midwest, 
uh, one of your, uh, and I call Midwest, where I'm from, Indiana, I call Midwest, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, you know, Minnesota, and then the Central Plains being your North, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, that type of stuff. Um, those obviously perform well because they're most consistent. And you're not, you're not, you're not sitting there looking to, to sell this thing at a forecast because that'll never go. You're expecting to maybe get two to three hundred basis points change in cap rate from your actual purchase. So those are the ones that improve the most, and that's where you could add the most value. Because there's also a lot of improvements you can add at minimum dollar amounts, uh, like paving the roads that give it just that initial kick to get the return on investment, and then also have let the tenants know that you're not just bumping the rents to gouge them. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's that's what our portfolio is right now. You know, we have. Yeah. 24 parks, mainly across the Midwest. And that's what we've, you know, and what we've been doing. Uh, but, you know, we look at some other operators that have different strategies in the more yeah. primary markets mm -hmm. and buying more stable assets. And, you know, they have different, uh, different cost of capital, different end goals. Yeah. Um, so it just, yeah, it's, and it's, it's uncovering those, it's picking up and looking underneath all the different rocks. And, and I have several clients today that are finding these still in these markets that, you would never think, again, if persistence is one thing, but you'd never think are still available, but they are. And so a lot of it is, you know, the, the efforts itself and, and the markets and understanding the markets. And, and, and again, it's also understanding where you want to keep pockets because you don't want to spread yourself too thin, have one in Kansas, one in Texas, one in Illinois, because you got to have a manager at each one of those. And in it, for yourself as an investor, your investors themselves, Traveling to each one of those is quite the effort, and it's also costly. You want to keep oh, efficiently using that as well. Yeah. Prior to our call, Brad, we were talking about analytics and data, and I know you're a, a big fan of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I'd be curious to to get your opinion on uh, the analytics and data in mobile home parks. Sure. And what does it show uh, about the industry and you know, what do you think the future holds for uh, mobile home park owners? Yeah, I think I think really the the artificial intelligence side has still yet to be tested. I have visions of what I think it can do. Uh, I think that's I think the artificial intelligence side is more driven towards being able to properly and efficiently process business by reading emails or or reading contents of documentation understanding what those files are, especially in my industry where you're not, typical consultants or, or brokers want to make sense of all the effort that's involved. And, and this, the, the AI that I'm employing to, to my platform itself, my proprietary platform is there to help create some, some, some efficiencies in how business is processed. I would say overall in the market itself, if I look at, and, I, and, and one of the things that I've noticed is looking at what rents are doing from the different sources of data that are available, either for pay or for free from the government, but things like where, where are two bedroom and three bedroom rents for, for the urban development, for, for the um, eight, for HUD, um, fair, market fair, fair market value rents or FMR to the, the, the governments. What's, what, are those, what are those trends offering? in those specific macro and micro uh, geoeconomical areas. So uh, like MSA, right? So typically in an MSA, you could look at a broad area, but when your community is sitting in like a Denver Metro, right? If it's sitting in the Highlands versus Aurora, that's two different areas right there. And so understanding what those, what those trends are doing with the market and then also having all the data points together with AI will start to associate what trends are actually moving according to each other. That's why I'm deploying it with my platform. That it takes millions of data points over several years for it to actually develop some pattern. But you combine what you do know from what all the experience I've gained and you plug those certain sectors and components into each other, but you let the AI tell you everything else. And that's why I'm that's why I'm employing it now. It's still obviously in its beta phase, and there's still a lot of data points that I'm merging together. But it's it's got it's got a lot of data points to review before I start to identify any trends. And that's 
you know, that's, that's the fun part about for me. That's where I geek out, so to speak. Is there any, you know, any data points that kind of show that rents are increasing at a certain rate? You know, can you can you give us? Oh, a yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I, could, I could peel back, I could peel back the layer a little bit, peel back the curtain for the eyes. I Please. Guess, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I would say, you know, a lot of data points that are that are associated. And I'm, I'm sure that Frank has said it in in a lot of the calls and and he's speaking, especially with Mobile Home University. But the actual time sensitivities, so the chronology of the data points themselves, with the actual statistics on the economy. The, the major employers, the schools, the population, the home values, um, what, are, what are rents for apartments? If you employ all those together with certain data points along the chronological scale, you can start to say, okay, I'm seeing patterns in this fashion with this specific micro market. And that's, you know, without, without giving too much of the secret sauce, that's, that's some of the stuff that I initially pull out right out of the gates. Okay. What hurdles does the manufactured housing industry face moving forward? Sure. I think what it faces itself is you're still not going to be able to some there there is some new development, but I would still say that developing new communities is going to be difficult. I think the the diversity of what is trying to be plugged into these communities, like the small homes, um, like RVs, all those different elements are still gonna be confronted with the typical financing issues that we've always run into. I would say overall, the what are the bigger companies that looking are looking to continue to expand, grow their portfolio? What's their next step? Because obviously the inventory for mobile home communities is limited. We've got 40,000 plus mobile home communities across the US. And if you look at the bottom, call it eighth of them, they're all the, the two small. To, to really fall into like the investment grade, right? And then the rest, you have the top half, that's all con- all the 500 plus lot communities, maybe even call it 250 plus lot communities that are, con- that are sought after by the public companies or the big dogs, right? And so what are they gonna do? They're eventually gonna have to pivot. And so I think the, what, what is the next phase uh, of what, how investment's going to take place from the top tier to the second tier investors and portfolio owners is probably going to be one of the, the hurdles itself. I'd say the other part, and, and we've always had this, and, and, and it's been going on for years, is what is going to take place as these corporations, and it becomes widely known that these are investment-grade properties. They are, they are cash flow uh, positive, uh, widely speaking. And what are, what are, they, what are they doing to, to create better cash flow, to increase value, to increase returns? A lot of that is raising rents. I had a conversation with some individuals over the weekend, and they heard that I was in mobile home communities. And one of the first things that they said, and, and again, it's not, I'm not acting like everybody should know about it, but they came to me and they said, well, I've read all these articles about you're just pushing people out of their homes, putting rents and making it unaffordable, which I sat down and I kind of smiled and I say, look, don't take this as coming from the corporate atmosphere. But let me just explain this in the pure black and white, right? And I think that no matter what, I think that this is always going to have a, a negative or a gray cloud over it. It's always had a gray cloud because of the investment grade of the asset itself. But now it's, look at the switch flipping. Now it's like, oh, we've well, got these big corporations pushing people out of their low-income housing. How dare you? You know, I think that's, you're going to be confronted with that moving into the future. And, and there's going to be coalitions within the community to, to, to come against the owners because they have maybe been bumping rents and, and the tenants don't want to see them raised. So I think that that's, I think that that's going to constantly be an issue. And I think taxation is going to be another. I think the, the, the governments and municipalities are going to grow wiser. They're going to start to say, okay, well, how are we going to start assessing these things in a, in a fashion that we can easily assess what may, um, multifamily apartments, right? Because right now it's still just kind of glorified land leases and it made a better way to explain it. So I think taxation and property taxes is going to change too. Wow. You, you touched on several points there. The one that kind of stuck out to me was you mentioned that like these large institutional buyers mm-hmm. of mobile home parks will eventually start to go after smaller properties. Right. Uh, and, and I find that interesting. 
I know you have some uh, some experience in multifamily. You know, what happened in that sector? What happened in multifamily and maybe like self-storage? You know, did those larger private equity groups, did they eventually start going after smaller smaller properties or did they still have that ceiling where yeah. 100 lots or higher was was the only properties that they would touch? Sure. I think, I mean, I, again, none of us have a crystal ball. I wish we did, right? Because that would obviously... Uh, we would be doing other things with greater and greater, right? We'd be uh, we'd be our Warren, Warren Buffetts, I guess, so to speak. But <laughs> I think um, I think what's going to happen is the pivot that's going to take place is it's going to move more from purchasing assets at cap rates and, and lower cap rates. I think it's going to turn into an M and A. I think that your bigger companies are going to start to pursue and purchase and or split and and um, uh, kind of buy majority shares in those mid-tier, second-tier companies that have portfolios. And so I think that they're going to capitalize and merge with those firms to grow their portfolio instead of trying to find that next big asset or a group of, of assets in a, a portfolio themselves. And I think those groups are going to work together. And then eventually, you're going to find your tier three that are going to start to assemble the lower uh, lot count communities. And they're going to assemble their portfolios. And it's going to be kind of that you, you pursue where, you, like if you're deep sea fishing, right? You pursue where you see the birds um, flying over and hovering and diving down because they're going after the bait fish. And you want to take your boat through that because that's where the big fish are eating too, right? And I think that that's, that's where we're transitioning. I think that that's the next pivot. That makes sense. What effect does a $15 an hour minimum wage mm-hmm. and inflation uh, have on the mobile home park asset class? I think overall, from it, it's employing this, your management staff in itself, right? Because you can't just give your manage, your community manager peanuts. Uh, you have to obviously follow all the, the, the employment rules for the municipalities and for the federal government. I think the, the, that wage or that eight, that wage range still fits within and it helps people to to find themselves actually quality housing if you look at what was taking place with the many the quality of manufactured homes themselves their the, the quality is boosting and so it's actually giving people an opportunity at still a lower lot rent to to have quality homes and i mean it's still today living in an apartment versus or or have, if, if, in that phase Having a nice home with a yard to myself versus having to live in an apartment building with walls around me, it kind of seems like the better route to go. And with the quality of homes that I saw, and especially with the transition that I saw over time with, with RB Horizons, um, I think it's, it's turning into the better option. People are obviously downscaling too. They're downsizing and, and looking at different ways to, to manage their expenses. Just things... Who knows when this when this pandemic? I mean, think about it. I'm thinking three years from now is when we actually see some light. Uh, people have a little bit shorter time scale, but I mean, people are going to start to save. They don't want to keep going through these. And if we're right now, where it's every ten years, if not shorter, that something happens. So I think that the the minimum wage is is at, at a rate at a point where it still makes this a quality rental, and it's not blowing it's not blowing their financials out of the door. All right. I asked this question to everybody, Brad. What does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes? In my eyes? Hmm. I mean, ideally, you, you, you have this one that's an infill opportunity that you have ultimate, you have alternate exit strategies. So something, it's, and you see it all the time here in, in Denver. You drive by it, and I point out all the time to people if I'm driving, with, I have a passenger or something like that. I say, that's a mobile home park right there. I'm like no way, so that's that's my ideal one. It's an infill, it's not overly packed. You have alternative alternative exit strategies. You could still operate it as is. You have rent growth, you have lot rent growth. You have decent quality homes. It's not overly packed. Um, and then obviously there's going to be a, some sort of an apartment developer down the road that's going <laughs> to pay well over what it's worth because they can financially make it make sense to create density in terms of a, of a high rise or mid rise apartment. That's my ideal one. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. Sure. Uh, last question. What is the, the value proposition at Cloverleaf Capital Group? And 
what makes you guys different? Yeah, I would say, and, and thank you for asking. I, I like to actually describe the difference. But my clients, a lot of clients come to me via referrals and, and they're saying, okay, what, what are you bringing to the table? Oh, so you're just a mortgage broker. And for me, I always correct them because I've been in the mortgage origination. I've been just a mortgage broker. I think the difference is we're not just there connecting people for, between where they are today and a debt source and waving goodbye. We're there in Cloverleaf's goal. And, and, and as, soon as, as soon as we finish out all of our website and all of our collateral and all of our materials, because we are still new, um, as soon as we finish that out, I want to be able to describe that this is a white glove way of approaching the overall investment. We're, we're your investment partners in the deal. We're, we're your interim, call interim CFOs. We're gonna help you understand how to separate community versus home financials, understand what is truly the value because you're talking to somebody who's seen thousands of communities, seen thousands of markets and go in and say, okay, this is where I think value should be. This is where I think what you can do. This is how I would operate. And this is how I would book your transaction. So really from, from start to finish, it's really a partner in the deal more than it is just a broker collecting a fee. And I think, you know, as we extend our menu of services, I think we'll be able to, to truly give that, that full range, that, that glorified mortgage broker investment consultant service. That's great. That's really good. And I know that, you know, from experience trying to get a loan under a million bucks, Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the Wild West, you know, you, you start with the regional banks and mm-hmm. uh, it's it's somewhat inconsistent. So, if, yeah, if yeah, and it, it some... all starts with the presentation, too, because if you if you go in and you if you just if, if you approach somebody that's not familiar with the industry itself, you say, here's here's I'm looking for a loan. They're going to look at it and they're just like, no, 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 this just isn't our space. But if you show them, I understand this. This is how we do this. I, this is I know what you want to collateralize. Here's what values are doing. This sponsor is like this, or this partner is really their stuff together, their experience. Um, it's all in the presentation itself. And many people say, well, do I want to spend one, 2% uh, to have an originator or have a uh, Cloverleaf Capital Group approach the lenders and then potentially have to pay an origination fee too? Well, you find out after, like you just stated, calling, smiling and dialing, sending the materials, getting turned down several times, that it's worth, it's so much worth that value. To, to, to spend that fee because you could focus on doing your due diligence on the asset itself and really refine that instead of having to deal with the headache that is financing today. And the certainty of closing, right? I mean, that's yeah. with a lot of these smaller banks, you run into the issue of, hey, we're going to get to the closing table and, and the, the big boss comes out and just vetoes the whole thing. So yeah. um, that's good that you have, have lenders under a million bucks. For sure. Um, Brad, what's your last tip for operators and investors out there, sure. you know, that they need to, that they need to know. I would say I'm dealing with it up and down right now, up and down. And it's, it's, it's frustrating. My clients, it's frustrating me because I don't, I don't have the time and the bandwidth to, to manage the lenders themselves and the title companies and all components, but I have to these days. And I would say the number one tip is be patient and tell your seller to be patient. If you're working on an acquisition, um, be patient yourself in a refinance. Uh, if you're if you're looking to take out and you have maturity coming up with your existing lender, it's not going to take 45 days. I'm working on some deals right now that I started and they still haven't closed. I started in September of last year. Straightforward, nice transactions, great borrowers. Still have not closed. They're closing this week. That's terrifying. What are you? <laughs> it's terrifying. It is terrifying. It is, and it's because you have low interest rate environment. And you have title companies that are swamped, and there a lot of lenders are still working on and off with the with the PPP and all these components of what the pandemic has caused. And remember, the traction and momentum still hasn't regained full speed. You still have the banks bringing back resources and bringing back people into the offices. So there's we don't have we don't have a full arsenal at yet at all these financing institutions and these title companies. So I, I, my biggest advice is whatever time you anticipate that it would take. So, so refinance, it's gonna take 60 to 90 days, if not more, probably more. I would say 90 to 120, unless you're working with your internal, uh, one of your internal banking relationships. For tra- for acquisitions themselves, 
be prepared to say 120 days, if not have a couple extensions available of 30 days. Because it's the lenders aren't overly inspired to close the deals. They know that they're the only options, they, especially banks. And sellers need to be patient. So I say, I guess, I guess the word is patience. Have having having patience and instill patience in the transaction. I have a big sign up on my, on my above my desk right here that says time kills deals. Yeah. So I I <laughs> I struggle with patience as well. And I am a big believer in in you know pushing every envelope as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to uh you know to get deals done. So um yeah, well, well, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Brad. Uh, how can listeners get a hold of you if they would choose to do so? Sure, sure. So right now, as in, in the the website will be launched here shortly. I'll be I'm, Cloverleaf is on LinkedIn, but I would say the best way to contact me today is via the office phone, which is 303-525-4850. And my email is brad at cloverleafcapitalgroup.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Brad. It was a pleasure you, having you. Uh, that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Bye. Hey, are you getting value out of this show? If so, would you mind please going over to iTunes and leaving the show a quick five-star review? I have a goal of hitting over a hundred five-star reviews by the end of 2021. And it would mean the absolute world to me if you could help contribute to that. Thanks ahead of time for making my day with your five-star review of the show.